Hey guys, Kate. This is going to be the first installment of what, hopefully, if I, uh, you know, if it works out, will be a, a series of stories. Um, call it the good old days or story time or whatever. But uh, for the first one, I kind of just wanted to let you know about a, a guy I. I knew back when I was younger. Now everybody growing up has people who help them along the way and you know mentor whatever you want to call them. But when I was really young I had nobody that I knew trapped, nobody in my family trapped, nobody in my family hunted for that matter. But when I was you know 15 I'd been trapping for a couple of years and my dad had bought a license so I could sell the fur. And then I, I got introduced through uh, Trapper's education course, the first one that was ever put on, to a fella named Lloyd Cook. Lloyd uh, was the longtime president of the Ontario Trappers Association at that point. And he, uh, you know, just, he lived for conservation what not, he, uh, humane trapping, he was a strong promoter of humane trapping, but he was a strong influence in my, you know, when I st started reaching out and getting out to places like uh, North Bay uh, Trappers Association, the uh, festival that they had there, and, you know, there I met people like Paul Millette, you know, who was just an awesome, awesome guy, lived up in Hearst. I know he passed away a few years ago. Um, my understanding is they found him like a like a true bushman out in the middle of a lake. His snowmobile was on, you know, burnt, and he was laying down on his snowshoes with his arms across his chest and and dead there. Now, I mean, that's what I heard. I wasn't there, so, but you know, I I can only presume that you know something happened health wise, and he must have put his snow machine on fire to try and signal somebody but anyways uh, that's only speculation of course but guys like Paul Millette who I, I then when I'd moved up north I ran into him again anybody who uh, has read the my book knows that part where I ran into him but the guy I wanted to uh, talk about is a guy named Joe Joe Cool. K-U-H-L. He, uh, he trapped on the trap line south of me um, on when I was on Hiawatha Lake. That's the first trap line that I had. Now he, the first year I was there, he didn't have that trap line. He, he has a, he had a fly and fishing lodge on Nagagami Lake called KV Lodge. And anybody, you know, you guys from Michigan, anybody that goes up there and does any flying and fishing, you got to check that spot out because like in the book I mentioned the Nagagami Lake. Well, I, I mentioned it a little bit more in my second book which is coming out, but um, it's an awesome fishing lake. And Joe, you know, I ran into Joe one time the first year that I was there, but the second year I was there he took over that trap line where his lodge was and at that point then I started you know getting to know him really good. Now Joe was an awesome guy, a bear of a man. Huge, I mean he had the biggest hands of anybody I've ever seen but you know he was just about the nicest guy you, you could ever possibly meet. You know some of the stories about him are just so so funny, well you know I mean funny because it didn't end up being tragic but you know I think this this I met Joe once that first year and then the second time I met him was the second year I was in on my trap line and I was paddling my canoe across Hiawatha Lake and all of a sudden I see a plane coming floating down and I mean I'm talking a uh, perfectly quiet there's no motor running 
And anyways, Joe floats down to a, a landing on the lake. And by the time I paddle up to him, he's out on his floats and he's looking under the, under the plane. So anyhow, I paddled up to him and he had just had his plane in for service. And I guess one of the, the mechanics hadn't put an oil plug back in properly and it blew out and blew all the oil out of his engine. And his engine, uh, well, I don't, I can't remember exactly whether he'd just seen the, the, the gauge drop or whatever and, and shut the engine off or if it had seized up. But anyways, he had come to a, an emergency landing on the lake and I ended up paddling up to him and then we tied the boat up to shore. I, I took him uh, in the canoe and we went across to the portage over to Nagogamy, portaged over and then I, I paddled him across Nagogamy Lake over to his camp and then I went back. Now from that point on you know we were pretty good friends. I mean I was an 18 or 19 year old kid at that time with my second year in there and and Joe you know over the, in the course of the next few years you know told me stories about you know his crashing the planes. He uh, I know he, he took off with a Cessna one time off the lake and banked around the behind his cabin to turn back towards Hornpane and banked her little <laughs> banked her little steep and stalled the, the plane out and, and just dropped it straight into the bush behind his cabin and just proceeded to you know, cr climb out of the wreckage and walk over to his cabin or to his camp and uh, and call for you know some some help I guess and another time and this was when I was there he had landed on on the Gogme Lake in front of his camp and the w wind was pretty high so he had uh, he was taxiing into his docks and the waves were rolling in there pretty good and and we went over one wave and the wind pushed the wing down and the next wave caught his wing and he he just flipped his plane right, right upside down so there's his plane upside down in the water he crawled out of the cab and just you know, he said the people at the camp were kind of in in awe because his plane was floating upside down with just his floats out of the water and uh, and him standing on the floats. Um, and then a another time he, well, this is the third and only other time that he ever told me about crashing his plane. What they used to do is in the fall when the ice was freezing along the shores, they obviously couldn't use their floats anymore, so they had skis on their planes then. And, you know, there'd be pretty good ice along the shores, but the middle of the lake could be open. So they'd come along and they'd skip along the top of the water. And then just as they got to the ice, they'd pop it up and, and then slide in on the, uh, on the ice to the shore. Well, Joe had an old Norseman. And, uh, and I guess he didn't, it didn't pop up quite as easy as the Cessnas did, so... Anyways, he caught his skis under the edge of the ice and, and just cartwheeled his, his plane across the ice and, and, and lived through that one too. He had a little bit of minor injuries on that one, but, you know, he was just the luckiest guy that way he ever wanted to meet. But, you know, once I, when I knew him, you know, he, he was just so full of stories all the time. And, you know, I'm... A young guy and he's telling me all the stories about when he's in the Navy in the Second World War and uh, and stuff like that and then I remember one instance he his favorite line was that he was in San Francisco in port and he was in a bar there and said he just kept licking his he was just sitting there minding his own business licking his eyebrows and the, the all the girls wouldn't leave him alone and that was his favorite line all the time but uh <laughs> I remember I came back to camp one day and Joe had left a note on my door. It was like 17 miles from his cabin to mine and he skidooed up, left a note on the door telling me to come down for supper. So I jumped on my, my snowmobile and booted down there and it was, I mean, I was used to eating, you know, bannock and 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 just, you know, not really good food, but Joe had cooked roast up beaver and had potatoes and and boiled cabbage and it was just you know such a good meal. 
And I used to eat quite a bit back then. And I remember I was on working on my third plate. And you know how you can feel somebody staring at you? And I, I, I just kind of looked up from my plate and he was just, just staring right at me. And I just kind of went, what? And he says, Jesus Christ, boy, you don't eat till you're full, you eat till you're tired. <laughs> and I just, I just never forget that. But, you know, he, he had helped me through, you know, lots of predicaments. Um, you know, there's a bunch of stories in my, in, that are coming in my second book that, that will, will be in there. But, you know, there, he had a, a partner trapping with him for quite a while whose name was Orville. Now, Joe, like I said, Joe was the nicest guy on the planet. Orville was not a trapper. Orville was a, an old fella. I don't know that he was quite homeless, but he, you know, he didn't have really a place to go. Joe kind of took him in on the trap line. Orville had spent a lot of time in the bush and, and quite possibly a little bit too much. Um, you know, we were fairly sure that he'd had cabin fever or or bush fever, whatever you want to call it. We call it being bushy. But, you know, your mind just kind of snaps a little bit when you're in the bush alone too long. And Joe had, Joe and Orville had gone into town and, at Christmas time. And it, it was funny because Joe told Orville right after Christmas, he said, go back into the camp and, uh, and I'll be in there in a couple days. I'm going to stay for New Year's with my family. And Orville didn't have any family, so it wasn't a big deal. Well, New Year's Eve rolls around, and Joe gets a phone call. It's the hospital. They've got Orville at the hospital. He, uh, he'd been picked up by a train crew about 1 o'clock in the morning, walking down the train tracks. It was, well, obviously January 1st, uh, you know, extremely cold. He didn't have shoes on. He uh, just had pairs of socks, and, you know, so Joe came to see him, and he was, Orville was, he says, Joe, I don't know what happened. He said, I barely got out of there, the cabin. I was cooking supper, and the cabin just blew up. The propane stove or something just blew up. He said, the whole camp's gone. And he says, I barely got out of there alive. He just had, a, you know, like a sweater on and, and socks. He just, so Joe's all in a panic. He uh, calls the air service, because Joe's plane's put away for the winter. He calls the air service, they've got a plane on skis, and they he hires them to fly him into the camp. And they get halfway in there, and they have uh, engine trouble, and they have to do an emergency landing on uh, a small lake halfway between Hornpain and Nagogamy. They end up spending the night there. The next morning, the pilot's dad comes in looking for him, finds him, stops, picks him up, they fly out to Joe's camp and, you know, they're circling it and everything looks normal. So they land on the lake and walk up and there's uh, the front door is wide open, the back door is wide open, Orville's supper sitting on the table. He, he must have just had an episode or something. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Joe went back to town and went to see him at the hospital and said, Orville, why did you tell me the camp was gone? There's nothing wrong. And Orville just looked at him and goes, I'm sorry, Joe. Things like this happen to me all the time. And that was just, that was just Orville. He, uh, he was just a character, but like I said, you know, I, I just, he's, Joe is probably one of the three people that, over my, you know, lifetime, I would consider somewhat of a, a mentor. And maybe not even three, maybe two. Lloyd Cook and Joe, he taught me a lot of stuff about, you know, being up in the bush in the north. Um, you know, he's, he's passed away now. I, I talked to somebody down that way uh, last year, and, and Joe's gone now, which is a shame. Um, but, you know, he was just a, an awesome guy, a huge, huge help. Like all, you know, old school 
guys from the north, you know, almost any of them would stop whatever they're doing um, to lend you a hand to do something. Um, because obviously the favor was returned. The, uh, you know, it's, he's one of the few people that I, I think about quite often from my past. And, uh, you know, he was just a great guy, but, you know, there's, uh, I always tell my kids and my granddaughters, well, my granddaughter's a little bit younger yet, but, you know, my kids and, and you, that you, you go through life and you'll meet thousands and thousands of people, you know, and, you know, maybe, maybe 3% of the people, you know, people that you'll be really close to, you know, and maybe 3% are people that you'll really despise. But in all reality, you know, the other 94%, you know, they're, for the most part, good people and, you know, and, and they, they can be acquaintances, friends for a, a bit, um, but just casual friends. But in reality, if they fell off the face of the earth, you'd probably never know about it. Um, you know, it's those 3% that really means something to you and uh, and the other three percent that you just you know stay away from so anyhow next time I do a, a little story time we'll uh, I'll have some more time to think about what but I just wanted to introduce you to Joe because he was an awesome guy one of the probably the man I respected more than anybody I've ever met. I mean, Lloyd Cook would be a, a, a close second, and, and so would Paul Millett, but Paul Millett was not somebody that I knew really, really well, but you know, I'd, I met him quite a few times and sat down and talked to him. And Paul was the guy who, he when I seen that accident on the highway, I'd been, he'd been out checking his traps that morning. It was 11 o'clock in the morning or something like that, 12 o'clock, whatever it was. And he was coming back from checking his traps that morning. And he had 28 beaver in the back of his truck. Which to me was just, at that time, you know, 18 years old. And you got 28 beavers in the back of your truck from the morning and it's only noon. That just astounded me. But he was, you know, catching eight, 900 beaver a year. So I guess if you're going to catch that many beaver, you better be catching 20, 30 a day. Anyway, that's it for this episode. We'll see you guys later.